Thank you all so much for making the time on the Friday morning after the big party. That is incredible. And I appreciate you all uh, coming to hear a little bit about this interesting time in the market today. It's a pretty unique moment in time where you have capital markets that uh, are actually looking like they're rebounding, an economy that is you know, a little bit in question generally, and a venture capital market that might not be as transparent to all of you. So part of the goal today is to talk a little bit about what's actually happening when you meet with a venture capitalist as an entrepreneur, um, what's going through our minds, and then even though it may seem like a little bit of doom and gloom when we first start the presentation. Trust me, by the end of the presentation, hopefully you'll have some interesting uh, ideas and thoughts about how to raise capital and how to come and talk to folks like us and a couple of my partners like Brian are in the crowd. So uh, really appreciate you all again coming this morning. So really quick, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Neil and I was actually a son of immigrants. They arrived in this country with $8, um, worked, uh, worked on the docks, then got their education. And uh, I'm, I'm incredibly blessed to have been raised and born in Silicon Valley, then lived in Chicago, New York, Boston, DC, before coming back a few years ago. Uh, I, the last 23 years in venture capital, so uh, if you have any questions or as my uh, colleagues like to tell me, I'm a bit of a historian on venture capital, uh, generally speaking. A majority of that time was 12 years at General Catalyst Partners. When I joined General Catalyst in 2004, the firm was about $300 million in total capital under management. Today, it's in, I think, the tens of billions of dollars. Uh, I was there, uh, you know, is there a way to turn down the music? Okay, great. Um, so. Uh, I don't want to like yell too loud for all of you. So uh, when, uh, when we went through uh, that growth period at General Catalyst from 2004 to 2015, the firm really changed from an early stage firm to a little bit more of a growth venture capital firm. Um, and I was really passionate personally about the early stage. So it's the stage of investment that probably a few of you entrepreneurs are at today where you need capital, but you also need a lot of help. You want people on your board who can put in the hard work and be with you when you're ready to raise more. And uh, that, is, that has been a passion and I was fortunate to co-found Defy uh, seven years ago. We have now raised three funds. Um, the first one was 151 million, the second one was 262 million. And thankfully we closed our third fund recently and just started investing out of it. It's $300 million. And uh, this is a unique and good time to have some capital. We're very, very happy about that. Uh, having done this job for way too long, I have actually been able to invest through three different downturns. So the first one was the famous uh, bubble, uh, the internet bubble of 99, 2000. I worked at a bubble venture capital firm called CMGI, which there's probably one or two of you who actually have ever heard of that firm, but it was a $58 billion market cap. That was a really unique time. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in a second. Then in 2008 and 2010, uh, you know, during the financial crisis, which was a little less tech related than the, the one a decade earlier, uh, I was a general catalyst. And then going through where we are right now in the venture business, uh, it's clearly, while the outside might make it seem like it's getting, we're gonna get through this pretty easily, uh, I think what you'll learn today is maybe it's gonna take a little longer than we think. Finally, you know, I've been fortunate to invest in great entrepreneurs. Our business is really about investing in people like you, people who are building software companies and people who are uh, thinking about building SaaS for the next generation. And that is folks like Sam Blackman at Elemental, Reggie Bradford at Vitru, uh, fortunate for, to be their first investors and, and eventually their exits in the hundreds of millions and sometimes billions of dollars. So VC capital raising is a business that is foreign to most of you, but we actually all have bosses, right? In the venture capital business. And those bosses are called limited partners. They give us capital. And right now our bosses are making very, very hard decisions. Those decisions are deciding which firms to continue to support. And the reality of our business today is that that is changing rapidly and there have you know, been a couple of trends in the industry that are changing. One is uh, long time managers, folks that come off the tip of your tongue, uh, change their business model. They went from traditional early stage investors to growth investors, and they started raising much larger funds. And those funds became billions of dollars. And what they tried to uh, 
provide to LPs was a really great multiple on return, but maybe not the massive multiples that their early stage funds had traditionally given. It is a very good business. So raising a lot of capital is a very, very, very good business, but it is not always in the best interest of entrepreneurs and it is not always in the best interest of our, our business. The second big trend that happened was that a lot of folks who have never done this job before started investing venture capital. That is a dangerous thing. We, it takes many years to understand some of the nuances of working with people, how to provide actual value to entrepreneurs that you're partners with. That does not come overnight. People think this is a really easy job and from the outside, it seems like it is. I just decide who to invest in, right? That's absolutely not the job because what's really important is that the next entrepreneur calls one of my entrepreneurs and they tell them that they should take my capital because we effectively are investing a commodity. We compete with people like Sequoia Capital and Benchmark and Excel and the best firms in the world. And when you do that, if you can't prove your wealth, I'm sorry, your worth to an entrepreneur, you're not going to be successful in this business. So when you look at this slide, again, there's some doom and gloom at the beginning of this presentation, but don't panic. Uh, they, this is going to be really hard to work through. That, um, that change from raising upwards of you know, $180 billion, we're now at 70% of it, assuming this is the first half and that doubles, you're down 65%. So two things have to happen. We have to work through all of this capital and then this capital is the new capital. So as you think about the, the next steps, it's, it's, it's a lot to think about. So I'll tell you a little bit more about venture and what you may or may not see when you meet with your next partner. Um, so behind the curtain, no one wants to tell you this. I'm an old man who's done this for 25 years, so I will tell you all of these things. You can uh, feel free to tell your friends. I won't, I won't be disturbed. Do not, first, before I get into this, because it's gonna sound like a bunch of whining, do never cry for an entrepreneur. It's like a mini violin, I'm for a venture capitalist. It's a mini violin. We have an incredible job. It's the best job on the planet if you love what you do and you love working with entrepreneurs. So while the business has become much harder, it is still the best job in the world. That said, partners that you meet with, 80 to 90% of them today are not listening to what you're telling them. And I will get more into that in a moment. They are distracted. They have limited partners calling them. They have their entrepreneurs calling them who are running out of money. They have to support their portfolio. There's a general malaise. Generally, if you go to a partner meeting right now, you have a lot of people licking their wounds about what's happened over the last few months, uh, really years. Uh, last summer, a number of my friends literally took the summer off because they were like, I don't want to deal with the pain that's coming. Um, and the woulda, coulda, shoulda. If I could tell you the amount of companies that I was distributed by General Catalyst that are public companies today and are now single digits, I, my wife would kill me, so let's not go there. Um, it is a ugly, ugly world when you own a bunch of public stock that's been distributed to you and it's worth significantly less. Should we have sold it? Probably. Should we have exited the position? Probably. People aren't focused on new deals. So the first priority of our job is when you take capital from somebody like Defy, you are our priority. That means you're part of our portfolio and you are the ones that we need to make sure survive and support. And so when, as a new entrepreneur, you're looking for capital, the meeting after you is them talking to their portfolio companies and saying like, okay, how are we gonna get through this period? Because I'm gonna be the one who has to support you. So the, the, the good part of that is you have L, uh, VCs who really want to support their portfolio. The bad part is they just can't talk to everyone and help everyone. It, now diving even deeper into what you don't hear, uh, partner pacing. You have a new, we have a new fresh fund, right? We have four partners and those partners each have a certain amount of deals that they're gonna do in a particular year. That, that's what each partner is gonna do, whether you like it or not. And that is often not a reflection of the entrepreneur. That is a reflection of the partner. So that you know, could be their seniority at the firm. It could be their trust that they have with their other partners. It could be where the fund is in its life cycle. If a fund's at the end of its life cycle, who are you gonna wanna deploy that last bit of capital in the fund? The one uh, investor who has great returns or the one investor who's new to the business? Like you think about it and you, you make your own decision. That is uh, just a reality of where we are today where you have a certain amount of deals a partner's gonna make 
And those partners sometimes have their own issues that they got to deal with. There is, again, going even deeper, there will be a lot of shakeup. Um, a friend of mine is on, the, uh, on a podcast that you know well, uh, and uh, the All In podcast, and they talked about a week or two ago about how there will be a absolute deluge of new uh, investors on the market and available new venture investors because people joined firms during 2020 and 2021 when capital was easy and firms had to get a lot larger. This is a cottage industry. It didn't look like that when there was $180 billion raised, but this is a totally different business than 99.9% .9 of companies out there. There are four or five partners who make investments at a firm, not 100 people. It is a different, it's a different type of business, and there's a lot of firms that are gonna have to let people go because the, as the assets come down under management, there is just less fee to pay people. Um, finally, again, something that would be less clear to entrepreneurs, some LPs are selling interest. You know, one reason our LPs at Defy are endowments, nonprofits, and foundations is because they have 50 and 100 year life cycles. When you raise money from certain offices or people who haven't been in the asset class or don't understand it, they usually will be with you for one or two cycles or they'll be with you a long time as long as things are good. If they're not, they won't. Um, so that is when things get bad and things are under pressure, LPs change quite a bit and that creates a real drag for the industry. Um, we, the, the last piece here, which is a little hard to understand, but I tried to explain earlier as your fees come down, I'm sorry, as your fund sizes come down, your fees come down. And that is an important part of how you pay accountants and lawyers and real estate and travel. That is, that is, that is just the reality as you get less capital and revenue coming into your firm. So investing through uh, 1998 through 2003, I was talking to my partner, Brian, um, and when you look at this chart, it was glaring. In fact, it, and it's from PitchBook, just to give credit where credit is due. But this chart is a little glaring for one really specific reason. When you look at the dollars invested in 2000, it didn't get back to that level of investing for 17 years till, till right here. So keep that in mind when you're looking and thinking about what has to go through this system. That was at $100 billion. We got in 2021 up to almost $325 billion. That is a crazy number, right? So when you look at this chart, it took a long time for us to get back. Um, and in 2008, the good news is the recovery was much quicker. So in 2008, you saw a dip in 2009 and 2010. By the way, in 2009 and 2010, that's when Uber, Airbnb were founded and built some of the best companies of our generation. Um, and so that will tell you that when you look at this, the, the, what happened now and how big the numbers got, you have a two pronged issue. You got to get through the capital that has been deployed or that is sitting on the sidelines and then they have to raise new capital so they can get back to a normal cycle. A normal cycle is not $300 billion invested. A normal cycle is somewhere between a third to a fifth of that number. So that is, you know, the, there's most, most people would say that the, the, there's only about so much that can be consumed of capital and that's what that will tell you. Here's the good news. Because that was all terrible venture capital news for all of you. And I know you don't care because don't ever feel bad for a venture capitalist. The, the, what entrepreneurs can do is very clear right now. And we tell this to almost every one of our entrepreneurs who is out raising capital. Three years ago, when you thought you were meeting with 20 VCs, you were meeting with about 18, 19 VCs. They're doing deals, they're active, they don't have portfolio problems. They don't have a bunch of folks who are getting in their way and stopping their investing. Today, when you meet with 20, you're meeting with four or five because they won't tell you the truth. The truth is that like 60, 70, 80% of them are not investing capital. Like they just won't. And you need to do the work about who is. So we announced our funds or they're filed with the federal government. We announced our fund in January of 2023. That doesn't take more than a Google search. So when you go and you actually want to know if the person you're meeting with has capital, why don't you see if their last fundraise was in 2016? Because then they don't. And that stuff is literally filed with the government so you can look it up as an entrepreneur. And I want to encourage you to do that. 
The easiest thing you could do is actually just meet with more people. We had a great company in the healthcare IT space last summer that was out of money completely. And the entrepreneur did two things. He fired his chief revenue officer and the CEO became chief revenue officer, which was important. Um, he closed three or four customers over the summer and he went from meeting with 40 firms to meeting with 120 firms, which sounds insane, right? But that is what he did. And it took three or four firms a day, maybe three, 400 uh, emails, hundreds of cold calls to try to set up meetings with 120 firms. And he closed his A round in December of 2022. And that is what it's gonna, it takes sometimes to actually see the, the, the 20 or 30 firms you thought you were seeing, you really gotta see 100. Um, today, which is scary, but realistic, and you can do it, um, because that's what entrepreneurs do, they fight through these things. Identify the right partner. My partner, Brian, is incredible um, at marketplaces because he's built companies there. My friend, Sean, who's in the second row, is a SaaS wonk. He knows everything about SaaS businesses and SaaS investing. Go find those guys. Like, they actually know in your business exactly what, you know, look at their portfolio, look at what they've invested in in the past. Those are the type of partners you want. And then manage your business tightly. This is the one thing that, out of everything you hear today, is manage it really tight. Um, the days of just trying to spend for spend's sake, or hey, you're not sure if this is spending on the right dollars. It might cost you top line revenue to do less services, but the margins aren't gonna be good. We're gonna come to metrics in a second. But be wise about how you manage the business because that is your only option. Do not put your faith in venture capitalists. We're, we're generally good people, but you know, term sheets get pulled, things don't happen, people don't have capital. Manage your business so that you don't need somebody else's money. There's also a lot of things you could do to get venture folks' attention in today's market. The first one is a little bit more data-driven, um, and so I won't, I won't uh, bore you with this. You could go to Scale VC, a, a good friend firm of ours, and they have all this information online. So Scale, Scale Venture Partners, those graphs are directly from their website. When you came to Saster a few years ago, what did you think about was really great growth, right? Really great growth when you're a million or two million to SaaS revenue, you're growing 200%, 300%, you're like, that's awesome, congratulations. Today, you walk into a partnership and if you're not growing like three, 400%, you might not even get the meeting. Again, it goes back to how you think about what you're, you know, how to, how to think about what areas to focus on as you build your business. Um, will your business ever be able to be sales efficient? So if you look at Jason Lemkin's blog, I would really encourage it. Um, he has some really interesting notes about how to make sure your sales efficiency is uh, high and that it's high margin. Um, you just gotta look at all of your metrics and think of them as what it is on steroids. So, it's the bar is higher. What does your churn really look like? Your ACVs now are not 10,000. You really got to start trying to sell bigger, bigger ACVs if you can. These are all things that I think you would all know, but just reinforcing that the bar gets raised. And if you can spend the time really thinking about how to reposition the business, increasing your, and it, uh, the bottom line is how big your company gets, right? So you have different size companies here. So as you think about it, how you reposition your business for this kind of new wave of what people are looking for in SaaS, uh, again, the data is available online for you to take a look. If you look through the investing downturn, there was significant uptick just looking at the last few years. But if you think about the years before the uptick, it was pretty consistent. So we're gonna get back to that type of level. So, you know, just take a look at the industry. This is pretty consistent, right? And this was a good time in venture. There were some great businesses built, the, the Figmas of the world and things were, were kind of created, you know, a little bit earlier, but you know, those are really good companies. This was like, will end up being a bit of a disaster for a lot of people, both on the venture side as well as the entrepreneur side. Look, we're quickly getting back to that level again. So there, there's good news here and that this does not last forever. You're gonna to have to work through this capital and then get a little bit smaller. So now how do you get people's attention? The last couple of slides I wanted to cover today is like thinking about your distracted uh, VCs for your SaaS business, right? We're distracted, we got a lot going on. We don't, we don't know everything about how to, how to uh, take in the new deals and the new deal flow. You know what's really easy? Doing deals or investments, or I'm sorry, partnerships, business development with 
another company that actually has venture investors who are really high quality. Um, and then reaching out to those people and saying like, hey, I just did a deal with your portfolio company. Can you, can you think through if like, we're a good fit for you? That's, that's really compelling to us because the first thing any of us are gonna do is call the CEO of that company or the head of business development of that company. So there, it's a, it, it quickly gets empathy from us to somebody who's actually working with one of our portfolio companies because that right there will help them understand better why we, we should be taking the time to be spending it with you. Uh, it, you really need either an intro from directly to a partner or something else to get you in the door. This is one way to easily do that. Look at the people you have business development deals with. See who their investors are. Reach out to them. Like, and if you know what, if they don't respond back, they might have called the, the partner and said, hey, that, that's, not the right, that's not the right thing. You should look at them. Or they might think of it as competitive. But generally speaking, that's an easy way to do it. Know your competitors. So I was, I was fortunate to invest in a company called Elemental, and um, they were building a software that sat on top of NVIDIA GPUs in 2006 for Interlay software uh, that was uh, all SaaS in the cloud, but using GPUs. Uh, they did a couple things. They initially got an investment from Jensen, the CEO of NVIDIA, which was pretty smart, um, going back to the business development and partnership piece. Um, and number two, they knew everything about the alternatives. They knew everything about the chips that were traditional chips. They knew everything about the other solutions to do encode and transcode, which is what they did in the cloud. Um, they, they knew everything. So when I actually flew out when I was a general catalyst to meet with them, it was in Portland. It was a beautiful day, which never happens in Portland if anybody's from there, but that, that was helpful. And the CEO could tell me every single thing about every competitor in the market because there were a lot at the time and why he was gonna outperform them. So getting to know your competitors is actually a really good thing because it shows that you understand the business. You understand who you're fighting against. You understand who's gonna be the one because that's the questions we want answered today. Um, research who your partners are fit, but be very open to associates. There's nothing wrong with associates. At General Catalyst, I was a principal and found the HubSpot guys and my partner Larry made the investment. Had they not spent the time with me, that would have been really bad for HubSpot and would have been really bad for my partner, Larry. At, at uh, General Catalyst, Nico um, was an associate maybe a year out of Stanford. He found Snapchat, just to be very clear. And those type of folks who are, you know, may seem junior, may seem not like the people you want to spend a lot of time with, are an important part of our ecosystem. We get it all the time. Like, I don't want to spend time with an associate. In this market, spend time with people who will listen to you and grok your business and really love you as a person because in a partner meeting, that is all it takes. Again, you need to get that first foot in the door, spend the time with the folks who know. Angels, we have some really great angels. There's a guy named Kirby up in Seattle who does a lot of SaaS and, and tech investing. If we see one from him in Seattle, we pay a little bit more attention, right? We're not paying attention necessarily if a big firm invests because that's usually kind of a negative signal if we're seeing it. Um, we actually spend more time when it's a really smart angel, like I said, Jensen at NVIDIA, who did uh, an investment in Elemental. Those, those are meaningful to us, so don't, don't uh, when you're raising your first bit of capital, a few of you are here, um, please do that. The last one is there's industry conferences. You're at one, so congratulations, step one. Um, and, you know, there's always like, people will drop their email, like send them an email. Like, and if it's not me, if, if, if you refer back to something maybe you learned today and I'm not a right fit because it's biotech, um, uh, I'll send it to somebody I know who, who is unique and thoughtful in biotech and knows what they're doing. So think about, you know, other ways to get in front and a few other little tips and tricks that we've seen in my last couple of minutes. And then we're going to have, I think, 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A. So in the last, the last is, if you were ever part of a team, and I bet at least half of you were here, of a very successful company, doesn't matter what it is, reach out to the founder, I'm sorry, to the partner who is on your board of directors. Reach out to them, cold to reach out. So if, uh, if you were at Facebook, reach out to Jim Breyer. He has his email online, reach out to him, he was on the board. And you tell him that he, you were an early employee at Facebook and he'll respond back. Like, I promise you, he will respond back. Like, it will, it will, okay, Jim will probably get me in trouble for that. But he won't promise you, but he will look at your email because you were on the team early there. You think about SaaS companies that have really scaled. 
you know, reach out to Darmesh at HubSpot. He won't necessarily respond to you, but if you were at HubSpot, like, you know, having an angel like Darmesh in your deal is very, very, very unique. And having him gone through the, the, the path, reach out to people. Um, this is one that our company Airspace uses a lot, and a lot of you might think it's silly, but it has worked incredibly well. Airspace is a logistics AI SaaS company. It's all, it's all end-to-end -end logistics. It's nine figures in revenue. It's very sizable. We were fortunate to invest very early. They literally, I think every single person who has ever met with Airspace, whether it be at a conference, whether it be at an uh, investor meeting, whether it, whatever it is, anybody who's met with Airspace is on their list, and every month, they send out like a customer uh, announcement. Every month, they send out a customer announcement, which is incredible. So every time they've ever had to raise, a VC like thinks they've known everything about airspace for years, basically. So I, I would encourage you, it, it, people don't always use things like being top of mind, but it's a very important and relevant thing you can do. We have another company, uh, Scubana, which the CEO, Chad, has done a great job being one with LinkedIn. It sounds silly, um, but the more time you can spend on LinkedIn, the more time you spend building your, uh, building your presence on LinkedIn, uh, it really does help. It's an easy thing. People use it as a social business network. Uh, one of my partners was there very early on and was there through the acquisition by Microsoft. It, is, it takes a lot of work. So before you poo-poo it, it takes a lot of work. Chad spends hours every week T t telling folks about why industry thought leader in a specific area. He does not promote his company. He just becomes an industry thought leader. Um, one that may or may not make a lot of sense to most of you, but it does to a couple of my partners is, you know, you, you shouldn't do kids activities just to meet people who want to invest in your company. However, you will be shocked at the amount of people who do those things, go to the games, and you get to know them as people. It's always easier if you get to know people for as people, and, and you get to know them through other things and other ways. Um, my friend Sean is probably the best at the next one, which is activities like games and golf. I don't play golf, I don't sail, but there are people who do, and if you can find them and have a connection with them, it's a good way, it's a good way to connect. Um, setting deals, so the last two are ones that you might not think about. Um, before you even know a venture person, or before you even know what to do, what is our business? Our business is actually making investments, seeing good deal flow. Entrepreneurs have the best deal flow. Like it is people you know from your previous teams or people you built, that is who has the best deal flow. You can start sending people deals as you get to know them casually, whatever it might be. That's a great way for us to get to know you and get to know how your network, network works. The last one is, you know, a lot of you have functional expertise. Just looking out into the audience, I know a few of you, and there's people here who really are deep in certain areas. We uh, are a partnership of four or five people, and then we have another 10 people who work at the firm. Um, we don't know everything, and we often will go to entrepreneurs to help us diligence deals or get to know different pieces. That is, that is what we do as a part of our business. So I would just encourage you to do that and think about what functional expertise you have for those. Um, the key takeaways before we get to Q and A, if you have any questions, is look consider what VCs are go dealing with right now during this downturn. There's a lot of capital in the market. Um, the bar is really raised on SaaS metrics. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but think about why the SaaS metrics are important. Even if you have to decrease your top line to be higher margin, um, find ways for your VCs to understand your business better. I explained a few op opportunities to do that. Think creatively how to get attention. Share some of your information. So thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate it. Hopefully it's helpful information that you can use, practical information about how to actually get funded. Um, and with that, if anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to, uh, to come to the center. And if you don't, no problem, <laughs> but feel free. <laughs> Thanks. How you doing? Hello, I'm Christy Rorg from Wet Dog Weather. And I'm wondering, should we be raising because we found it so hard in 2022 that we decided to go and get profitable. Yeah. And so we are now profitable. We actually are making money every month, but we're also a team of four sure. <laughs> and in a very niche market. Um, the niche market, so two parts to your question. We were just talking about this earlier today. There's nothing wrong with being profitable. It is a great thing, even if you're four people or 10 people, 
That is exactly what I had said earlier about finding your path to like having your own destiny under your control. That is 100% the right thing to do. So congratulations. Like Thank you. you should get a little applause just for that. <laughs> um, that's awesome. But the, that is great. The bigger question whether you should raise is probably the niche market. Just to be transparent with you is if you could raise a profitable, good business in a niche market, over time you could cash flow yourself probably more wealth than you would by raising 30% dilution from a venture mm -hmm. firm. Does that make sense? Very if you nice. felt like the market could expand, this is a great time to talk to people because people would love to see that you have control of your destiny, you understand the levers of your business, you got it to profitability. So in that case, I would probably argue this is a great time, but that's really up to you to determine whether you're gonna stay in the niche or expand your horizontal inside of the market. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank you. Great, thanks. Hi, how are you? Hello. Uh, I'd like to ask, like, what's a starting point for finding these kind of uh, VC firms that can invest in your product? Uh, you talked about the research, so I'd like to know more about how to research them and, and find their portfolios and so on. Sure. Good news is 99% uh, of firms have a website. Um, so the first way to research them are things like Crunchbase or PitchBook or other, there's resources that exist online. So you could find every firm that's invested in every company, that is all available because most of that stuff is government filing. So you can actually, they pick it up on PitchBook or Crunchbase, like you could, you could find the firms. And then go to the websites of those firms and every partner has their companies listed next to their name. Find out the companies, see if it's relevant to you. And then you have a couple of choices. I think experienced, well-connected entrepreneurs go to their LinkedIn and they find a way to touch one-to-one -to, -one to that person, right? So if you, someone in your network, you could email and say like, hey, could you introduce me to Sean at Norwest, right? Like, let's, let's, let's figure out how to make that happen. That's the best way because it's, it's a one-to-one it's -to -one touch point, right? The, the second way is you could out cold call reach them. It's not too hard to guess my email. Um, and so you can go outreach to them. I wouldn't use the HubSpot, I mean, as a HubSpot investor, I'm proud of what they've accomplished, but I wouldn't use the HubSpot kind of auto-generate like email. I'd write something specific that you write to them um, that is about them and why you're a fit for that particular firm. That feels like a lot better. Um, so uh, that it's up to you either way, but go to the databases that exist and are free. Great. Okay. Go to the websites once you've identified the partners who are a good fit. Perfect. And then number three, best thing to do is try to find a connection to one of them. And then the second best thing you can do is cold re outreach to them because our job is the deal business. So, you know, coming out of this, I gave you my email, email me. I'm happy to, whether you're fit for us or not, the fact that you reached out, I'll try to send it to somebody that not, they might not respond to, you know, because it might not be a fit, but feel free. Okay. okay? Thanks. Thanks so much. Go ahead. How you doing? Good, good morning. Uh, so in one of your earlier charts, you showed kind of the flow of the money and yeah. a little bit of the implication is we're probably gonna go through a period where money is gonna be down. We know the impacts that's kind of had in the startup scene and everybody's predicting like, oh, you know, we're probably gonna have 80% failure rates. Could you talk maybe a little bit from the VC side? What does this mean? We've seen anybody and everybody who can become a VC. Sure. Do we have too many of them? Or are they gonna go away? What is that gonna look like? That is a great question. And again, I'm happy to be honest and transparent with you. There was this huge influx of firms and I, I've had the pleasure of talking to a few really smart LPs and the influx of firms, one is probably over, at least for the near term. So you won't see a lot of new first time firms getting started. You, you will see one every now and then, but it will be much less than what you saw. And raising the second funds is going to be nearly impossible. So that is, that is not necessarily a reflection of whether they're good investors or bad investors. It's just much harder. Um, there are great folks, there's, there's a, uh, somebody I'm meeting with later who's in, the, who's in the audience who, he's a tried and true a successful investor. He's raised his first or second fund. He might be able to raise the next one, but the folks who are first timers who've never been investing or doesn't have, don't have a track record, raise that second fund. So they will go away. So there will be a shrink in the industry of the, of the first time. And again, not a reflection of them, almost more a reflection of the fact that LPs have to make hard choices. And if you've been investing in X firm for 40 years, you really want to keep investing in that firm because you want to make sure you get to the next fund that has Facebook in it, right? And it'll be a 10X fund and it has a great, great return. So you just have to make hard choices. In 2010, I was at a firm that one of our LPs were making hard choices and they went from 14 to down to nine, nine managers, right? 
who those five managers, I would guess four don't exist anymore. The ones that they didn't participate in and in, in, uh, be in the firm. So there's a natural like kind of decrease of the overall number of firms. And that's why I mentioned like you really got to do your research uh, in terms of who has capital, who doesn't, who's spending, who's going to be a good use of your time when you're meeting with them. Because the reality is that's um, that's you know that's how you tell as an entrepreneur but to, does that answer your question basically gonna get smaller there's gonna be fewer firms uh, some of the ones who have been around for a long time will have successful LPs who will participate but the smaller ones it's just unlikely that uh, most of them will exist it you saw the numbers it just got too big I mean it just it got it just there was just the the, the dollars got a little bit you know uh, oh, let's just go to this sorry that like the, this is when the, the largest creation of venture capital firms in the history of the business by a factor of seven, right? Like was right here, and th this is this year, right? Like it's so far, like it maybe goes to here, but it ain't going. It's not going to any of these, right? So that is that is just this should tell you right there what's going to happen, and it's not rocket science. There's just going to be a decrease, which is which you know maybe it's the punchline is it's super healthy for everyone like it's more efficient with your time to go to people who have capital it's better for the firms that there's not a bunch of people overpricing deals so that now the round that comes up post the overpriced round is a down round and difficult does that make sense Sorry, go ahead hey so what you're talking about right now is that a, would you say that that's pretty much centered around bay area and and, and even coastal vcs or are you and you, you may not have this knowledge but you think the same thing applies to VCs that are raising like in, in the interior part of the country? It's a good question. So 94% of institutional capital goes to San Francisco, New York, and Boston. I mean, so that was in Boston and Los Angeles. So um, in the 6% or 10% that is not San Francisco, New York, Boston, and Los Angeles, uh, absolutely not. So that is, there's been firms where probably will not nearly be as impacted as the 90% of capital that is on the coast, right? So the central firms in Ohio, there's been some great firms raising. In the, in, the, in the Midwest, there's a number. It doesn't impact it because the base number is different, right? The base number. So you might see an increase in Midwest firms raising capital, but the, uh, these are aggregate numbers for all of EC, and the 90% on the coast where the, the base number is doesn't go down. Great. Great. Great chart. I came late, so I only saw this. But the, the question then is, I assume that most of these VCs will be reinvesting in the companies that manage to Correct. raise uh, B and Cs, right? The D side of it, from what I've seen, um, apparently the valuation chopped by half. So that means that the VC firms are going to have to to reduce the, I guess, the value, the valuation of those companies, right? So what do you predict to be the future for the companies that's already been funded? You know. Sure. So if you're like her, you don't have to worry about it because she's profitable. <laughs> so that's the number one: is if you can get your company, then you don't have to worry about what we price your deal at, right? So that's 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 one good thing. Two, it really depends on what your last round was and whether you could grow into that valuation. So what happened in this period of time was valuations, uh, some well-known firms that I will not say their name, uh, hiked up deals to 2X what the probable market value of was the deal, right? And if you took that money, good for you, because that, that means you got less dilution. But the challenge is when you come up, if you need capital again, if you don't need capital again, it's great. But when you come up for that next round, it'll be flatter down. I mean, you should just be assume that. And there's a lot of people writing about that now. Entrepreneur uh, investors, the new investors want you to be motivated. So they'll carve out equity so they make sure you're motivated to stay on and your team is motivated to stay on. So there's good answers for entrepreneurs. It's not all bad when you do a down round because you should be motivated to continue to build and grow your business. It's not the worst thing in the world. Um, but a majority of the overpriced rounds, if you can't grow into that valuation, will come down. Even the big companies have already done it. So that's the first step is the big companies who are raising it, like the ramps of the world announced, a down round, right? Um, and like really good company, incredible founders. Everything's great about that business. Well, the last round just got ahead of them. That's okay, that happens. So it will, the, these things will come down and that's okay. Sorry, last couple questions because we only have five minutes. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Great, thank you. Esther uh, Iyama. Wait, yes, Hi, Iyama. Esther. New last name. Got to get used to that. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, this might be a little taboo. I'm going to ask the question sure. anyway, and I recognize you can't endorse anybody because you obviously are a client of one. 
But um, I'd love to ask a question about the role of the attorney sure. for either side. There's a lot there. I mean, we're here in Silicon Valley. There's a lot here that both have clients that are uh, founders like myself, as well as the venture capital firms. But for the founder, um, what would you say are the characteristics that that we as founders should be looking for in the right attorney? Context, I've already raised from a few pretty senior angels, yep. and now we're going for our first like institutional round. And so I gotta be really thoughtful about um, yeah. the attorney we bring in that's gonna advocate for um, our team, our current uh, investors, and blah, blah. So it's a great question because no one ever brings it up. So that's a great question. Um, and we can, so our attorney at our firm, for instance, is almost a partner at our firm. He's that important to us. He was there from inception. He gave us great guidance. He's been a friend, John at Cooley, for what it, it's worth, is, uh, is a really great partner at our firm. I think there's a couple things to look out for for an attorney who's your advocate and is, a, is, is um, and, and there's one tactical and then two uh, just important things to think about. One is, are they business oriented? Mm. Or are they like attorney attorneys? We're worried about every single, because that's just gonna run up your bill. Like it, it, business, do they understand that there's flexibility in the, how business gets done versus how law gets done? It's a hard thing to research, but you can talk to their other founders. Do they, you know, it, it, it's, it's a double edged win for you because if they're business oriented, they tend to get through things more efficiently and not rack up a bunch of bills, yeah. right? Um, and then the second thing that we, we've always found um, to be helpful is just you can do the research on their experience level generally around your type of business. Because you can get the hottest attorney at Wilson Zini, but they only do M&A late stage transactions. They're not going to help you at yeah. all. Like yeah, it yeah, is yeah. a totally different lawyer who does early stage, um, you know, like early stage deals versus one who does the, the growth or M&A. Um, and so that and then just tactically, we don't we've never had a problem. We tend to use the coolies and the big firms, but that's because we're a venture firm. And yeah. I think our LPs like it. You, we, there's no problem with like scrappy lawyers who um, are business oriented, who understand tech. I would encourage you to, to find those. You don't have to use a big firm um, as long as you cover those other two bases pretty well. Thank you. Thank you. All right, last question, because we only had a couple minutes. Excellent presentation. Oh, Manish with Very Kahoot. Nice uh, bootstrapped the business to 5 million revenue Congrats. Yeah. and approaching profitability. Neil, at .vc. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so throughout the conference, we heard a lot about SaaS and SaaS only, but the, the SaaS plus services marketplaces, networks, Ubers, and Airbnbs, which are extremely hard to build yeah. and requires a crazy amount of operational expertise. Um, any thoughts on those kind of businesses, which is not as forgiving as SaaS? And yes. second, second part to that is um, growth versus profitability. Yeah. Bootstrap business, you just mentioned that the metrics are going up and yeah. you expect even higher growth rate. How do you think about those a business that extremely hard to build, you got to now grow even faster and reach profitability, bootstrapped, any tips? Yeah, well you did it, so that's one great thing that you got to profitability. Um, so uh, we were fortunate to invest in Airbnb early at General Catalyst, it was a complicated business and Brian and the team raised a lot of capital because the, the business underlying the core business, even though it was logistically complicated, um, did require a lot of capital and he raised it early in the life cycle of the company. And the only way you could do that is to show the metrics that are gonna be, hey, this is a huge market, so there's a TAM issue, and then it's gonna, and, and we can show you why this is gonna work fundamentally. And so when you are bootstrapping, it's okay to keep small and keep it break even versus be profitable, <laughs> I should be clear. Like it's okay to be break even, but you, it would be really important that you are continuing to approve those metrics because if your business is complicated, it will need capital, right? So it is, you also don't want to starve the business of capital. And if it is complex, just try to, try to get to the point where you think you're addressing a market that's large enough, prove that it is. That's why I said, know your competitors, know what's going on in the market, but prove that the market's big enough, prove that your metrics will, you know, take that into account. Um, and, and, and then go out and talk to folks who are even bigger checks than us, if, if necessary. So there's incredible firms, the Meritechs of the world, the, the, my old firm GC, Lightspeed, those type of folks who do big, big checks for companies that they will do at that early stage, but Norwest, sorry, Sean. Um, and like there's people who will do that who like will build those types of businesses, right? So that is, that is, you know, there's a reason those firms exist. There's a reason those businesses exist. So I wouldn't be shy about it. Uh, it will take 
three to four times longer than it did two years ago. I just want to be transparent with you. And that's why you're saying like a tip is keep operating it so you control the lever. We always say milestones and levers when we're talking at board meetings, like what are the levers that you control, right? You really can't fire people in and out. You really, but can you focus on certain customers who are highly profitable? Can you de-emphasize some costs in the business that, hey, you can ramp up as you're having the conversation with the VCs, but then ramp down if those are gonna take longer or extend the time frame. So it's really about having that control over your business. Thank you so much. Thank Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Sorry I'm out of time, but I appreciate it. Feel free to reach out and uh, thanks. Have a great day.